This is a huge problem that candidates make. If you do it, you're going to, you know, continue to fail the exam. You're going to Hello, and thank you for coming to check out this video. I'm actually doing a video that um, may have some things on here that you expect to be common sense. Some of them won't be. And then also, you know, when you're in the exam environment, some of the common sense that, you know, you can apply outside of the exam environment, you know, it's just a different beast. You know, you're inside of uh, what some people call the pressure cooker environment. Now, I've been mentoring CCIE candidates ever since I was a senior candidate and people were coming to me, you know, asking for advice or assistance uh, with navigating certain situations. And then I've continued to mentor candidates even after I've passed the exam. I'll have some really good links in the description of the video that you can check out. And also, uh, before I get into the content of the video, I want to bring your attention to this new podcast that I'm listening to. It's called Conf T with your SE. If you like listening to podcasts and if you like talking about technology and listening to experts talking about technology, check out this podcast because um, that's exactly what they're doing. They're bringing on experts of the field and letting them talk about their technologies and their products. Check it out, let me know what you think in the comments. One more thing before I start the video. I like when people tell me where they're tuning in from because it's pretty cool to see the reach of these videos. So just let me know where you're tuning in from. I've had some folks from Australia, some folks from Amman, Jordan, um, Germany, also folks from Ireland and the UK as well. And uh, you know, a lot of folks from within the United States. So let's go ahead and jump into the video now. There's going to be a lot of important notes about the proctor in this video. First off, we'll talk about who the proctor is, that they're there to facilitate the exam. They're there to make sure that the exam is going properly. People aren't doing things that are in violation of the policies and just making sure that the equipment's working the way it's supposed to work. The proctor is not there to be anybody's friend. They're also not there to be anybody's, you know, enemy. They're not there to help you pass the exam. They're not there to help you fail the exam either. In fact, when it comes to grading, there's a script that does the grading, and then if the script marks anything as inaccurate, the proctor goes in and checks those particular sections and goes through to make sure that the candidate actually did miss the requirements for the test. Another note about grading is that it's done not by the proctor who, uh, facil who was facilitating your exam, uh, it's done by another theater, right? Because when you are done testing and you're going home, that's the end of the day for the proctor as well. You don't really expect them to stick around after work to grade your exam. So it's going to go on to the next center who then grades your exam. And something to think about when you're scheduling your exam is that um, grades are going to be delayed if you take the exam closer to the weekend. Grades are also going to be delayed if there's a holiday uh, in certain regions of the world. So be mindful of those different things that can affect how quickly you get your grade back. The next point I want to talk about is how to interact with the proctor. The E in CCIE is expert. So you're a candidate to be an expert. You shouldn't be going to the proctor asking questions that start with how or why. If you do that, then you're already setting yourself up to be wasting time and probably not getting what you're looking for. For me, whenever I was interacting with the proctor, I looked at them as the service provider. I knew that if I had to go to them about anything, I was going to bring as much data as I could as to you know, show why I need your assistance on this, why I can't do it. So if there's a problem with a device in the environment that I don't have access to that device, maybe I would get packet captures from the device I do have access to and get logs and show, hey, my device is doing X and it expects Y from your device, but your device isn't doing Y. So I need you to look into that as the proctor. I need you to make sure that the device is uh, working properly. Now, understand that you really need to know what you're talking about and you need to actually be bringing factual data. You can't just go and try to manipulate the proctor into doing things because they know the environment, they know the types of logs that you're bringing them. So they're gonna see through if you're trying to just, you know, bring up fake data to make them do things. So make sure that you actually know what you're doing when you go to them to ask for assistance with certain products. This next one is a hard lesson that I learned. Um, the website, when you're going to check your grades, for me, I was refreshing it like every five minutes. Um, I couldn't wait to see my grades. When 
you log in too many times or you re or if you refresh the page too many times, eventually you'll get a screen that says you've been locked out due to um, excessive logins and you'll have to wait 24 hours. There's no warning beforehand and they don't tell you anything about X number of logins remaining. You just eventually get a warning saying that you've been locked out and you have to wait 24 hours. The problem about that is eventually you get your email that says, hey, your grades are available. Go to the website to check your grades. And unfortunately, you're locked out. So you have to wait the remaining time for that 24 hour window, all the while wondering what your grades are. So uh, my recommendation to candidates is that you just wait until you get the email and then at that point, go log in and check your grades. Also, it seems that whenever there's a big change in the CCIE, they say, hey, the last date to test is, is this date, whatever it might be, February 24th for this year, 2020. Um, uh, in the past and even this year, I've seen that they open up new seats or they extend the amount of time when you can take the exam. One person I saw on Twitter put up that they were trying to log in to check the seats and they were told that they need to check later due to the amount of logins. So again, uh, be very mindful of how often you're logging into the site. This next item is actually a hard pill to swallow for most candidates. Your configuration is wrong. I can't tell you how many candidates swear that they've passed, everything was working exactly as it should be, and they swear that they passed the exam. Then they get the results back and it turns out that they failed and too often candidates will blame it on other people. They'll assume that Cisco is not grading properly. They'll assume that the proctor is basically um, out to get them. The moment that you start thinking like that, that's the moment where you stop correcting your configuration. You need to always assume that you missed something in the exam or that your configuration is wrong. So when you look at it that way, you keep it inside your control. You understand that you need to figure out what it is you are doing wrong instead of blaming it on somebody else. This is a huge problem that candidates make. If you do it, you're going to, you know, continue to fail the exam. You're going to continue to miss the points. And um, the longer you go trying to take the exam without making progress, the higher the likelihood that you're going to burn out and just eventually quit chasing the CCIE. So make sure that you keep things within your own control. Understand that you're doing something wrong if you're not getting the points. Figure out what you need to adjust, make that adjustment, and then execute in your next lab attempt. This one is something that for some reason people just don't tell you about it. It's the post CCIE slump. It's almost like a depression after you've passed the exam. You think you'd be so excited. You think you'd be so happy. But for some reason, um, after you pass the exam, you have this slump, you have this down period. And for me, I actually started looking into going into management. I was so tired of dealing with technology. It was, it was my life. It consumed me almost every hour of every day. I didn't really care to have conversations with people. I was thinking about my technology. I was thinking about what I needed to do to pass the exam. So when I finally passed, you know, I had forgotten how to have fun. I wasn't keeping up with people. So I didn't know who was doing what, when I had no plans. It was just this void. I had this almost like sole goal in life of passing the CCIE exam. So imagine your one and only goal in life and you achieve it. And then it's like, what now? You know, you don't get any big change right after the fact. You, you expect that, oh, I'm a CCIE now. And for, for me, I didn't really expect that. I, I expected nothing really. But I guess maybe subconsciously I expected something because after the fact, there was this like post CCIE slump. I've talked to plenty of other candidates. They've had it. Tony E, uh, if you follow him on Twitter, on YouTube, uh, he talks about how after the fact, um, he kind of had this period of like a slump, right? So it's a real thing. Just understand it happens, understand it goes away. It took me about probably a year for that to go away where I decided, like, I don't know what it was. I just needed to get more projects or something to occupy my mind. And then as that happened, as I started doing things I was interested in for technology, again, writing code, working on exams, whatever it might be, um, you know, that helped me get back into enjoying what I was doing and 
getting out of that slump. So I don't know how long it takes other people. If, if you have gone through that before and you remember how long it took you to kind of get, get back out of it and get focused, um, please comment down below and let us know. Let's talk about the images in the uh, exams. Ben Ning, who's actually the person who creates the CCIE collaboration exam, he has some Cisco Live presentations and I've looked at them and he puts up these particular scenarios of, you know, candidates or troubleshooting things in the lab. One scenario he gave was the picture of a screenshot of a phone up and you can see that the screenshot has these different soft keys at the bottom. And the exam basically was saying, you know, make your phone look like this image. It didn't say make your phone have these soft keys. It said make your phone look like this image. Well, the candidate says I did that and I didn't get the points. So Ben then puts up another image that shows what the candidate did. And yes, it had the different soft keys that the image had. However, if you look, there's a, a button here, which, meaning, which means that there's more soft keys. So you met the requirement in the sense that you put the proper soft keys. You missed the requirement in the fact that um, it said make your phone look like this phone and yours doesn't because you've added to it. There's a lot of other tasks where you can do that. You can be a little creative and add in some extra things. In one of Ben's Cisco Live presentations, he admits that um, they're grading against you meeting the task. So if you add in some additional config, that's fine. Um, as long as you meet the task. The problem here is that the task was an image and it said to make yours look like the image you added to it. Now you've made the images, you know, be different. So basically there's some games out there where you can look at two different images and you can find what's the difference between the Im images, you know, where they look almost exactly the same. It's kind of like that game. Look at your phone screenshot, look at their screenshot, make sure that there's no discrepancies. So for me, when I was doing workbooks, if somebody had an image of say like Cisco Jabber and there was four missed calls, I would call into my Jabber client four times and not answer them and make sure I had four missed calls when I left the exam. That's the, how granular I was getting with it. And it's best to be that way. Let's talk next about strategy. You have to have a strategy when you go into the exam room. Mark Snow had a strategy where he would type up all of his configuration into Notepad++ and then that way he could then paste it into his iOS config um, later. I adopted that strategy as well. The other thing I did was I would um, type the least amount of letters in Notepad++. I would type the least amount of letters for entering a command. So if I wanted to go into, you know, if I wanted to even just do a show command, show voice compact brief, um, I think it was show voice, show call active voice compact. So mine would say show, show, call act voco something like that right everything was abbreviated to the least amount of button uh key presses that i had to do i really liked that from mark snow's uh approach so i adopted that kevin wallace had an approach where he had a little um like a document where he would draw out and it would have each and every device right each server and each ios device and then it would have their subtasks listed out in the order that they should be done right so then he would go to one device and he would do the configs on it, and then he would one line the subtasks that he did. I liked that approach as well. You can find it online if you really want to see him explain how he did it. Um, so I adopted that approach as well. Another strategy that I had was I would not test any of my configuration until I had gone through the entire exam and did all of the configurations. Here's why. Some candidates will get into the exam and they will do the first task or whatever it might be, then they'll start doing show commands and they'll start testing the features or whatever it might be. They'll start doing their work in testing their, in validating their configuration, right? What does that end up doing? They find something wrong. Now they spend an hour, let's say, troubleshooting that thing that they found wrong. You're not going to get that time back. Now you're going to have the wrong mindset. You're going to be off your game. For me, I'd go through the whole config, soup to nuts, get it all done. And then when I was done, I'd step away to go get some water or use the restroom or whatever. And then I'd come back and I'd start testing. And then whenever I found anything wrong, I'd troubleshoot that. But at least I knew that my entire config was done. So if I lose points on this one task that if I just don't get through the troubleshooting, then at least I don't lose points on everything else that I didn't complete because I completed it. Also, something that a lot of people say is that 
If you can get done with all of your lab configuration by lunchtime, then the likelihood that you'll find your mistakes and be able to read through the exam and notice what you missed, that, that's really high. But you should leave at least two hours at the end of the exam just for rereading the exam and for testing your configuration, troubleshooting, and fixing any of your problems. At least two hours at the end of the exam should be spent on that. This next one gets back to um, something I mentioned earlier somewhat. Cisco Live presentations, go check them out. There are people that develop these exams that make Cisco Live presentations, and there are gonna be some really good nuggets of information in there. The whole presentation in itself might not help you too much, but the little bits of information that are in there that provide clarity are extremely helpful. They cannot be replaced. I didn't find them anywhere else. You can create a Cisco Live account free, and then you can go in there and browse the Cisco Live presentations and see what the proctor, or not the proctors, but see what these people are saying about the CCIE. Go in there, find your particular exam if you can, check it out. I guarantee you it's going to be of value. For this last one, get on social media. I wasn't on social media very much. I had Facebook and that was it. I didn't have any Instagram, I didn't have Twitter, I didn't really do much on YouTube, none of that. But looking back, if I were to do it again, knowing what I know now, I would be on social media a lot more. Now, you're going to have to manage it. If you're getting on social media and you're spending a lot of time there, you're not studying, you're not focused on what you should be on. So why do I say go and get on social media? I say it because there's a lot of other people out there going through the same journey. There's a lot of other people out there studying the same exam as you. And probably your spouse isn't going through it with you. Your kids aren't studying it. Your coworkers aren't studying it. In fact, only 3% of people in the field get their CCIE. So you are going to be among a very, very small percentage of people. You can be on social media interacting with other folks who are going through the same exact journey that you're going through. Now, getting back to saying, you know, you need to manage your time about being on social media. A friend of mine used to use an application or a software, I can't remember what it was, that um, would actually only allow him to log into Facebook and other applications between specific times. If it was outside of that time and he went to go log in, it would tell him, hey, you know, you can't log in right now. Refocus on what you need to be doing. My approach was that I would actually delete Facebook off my phone. I, I got to the point where I was logging into Facebook so infrequently that I would forget my password. I'd have to go and reset it. So while it's good to be connected and while it's good to go and reach out to other people that are going through the same version through the same journey as you you have to manage your time make sure that you're not going and logging in to um, this social media stuff too much if you are a current CCIE candidate or you're a CCIE who's gotten their number or even if you're a candidate who just you know, burned out or whatever it might be. And, or, or, you know, sometimes there's life circumstances that get in the way and people just don't get to continue on the journey. They have to, you know, cut ties with it and go a different way. Regardless of any of that, if there's something I didn't mention here that you think a CCIE candidate should know, please comment down below and, um, you know, share your knowledge with everyone else so that they can understand what they need to be doing moving forward on this journey. I hope the video was of value, and as always, I'll see you in the next one.